thinking about uh, identity, our, our roots in Africa, Haiti, or Cuba. We is a Bahamian, but Columbus got us all messed up. And we don't know whether we're black, sambo, mulatto, or even truly white. Intentional thought and consider where we go from here. Stay tuned and listen to Chris Omoshenko go uh, enlighten us on our roots on the effect of gas lighting. We'll be right back after these messages. Something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. Welcome back to something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. What we think, we become. What we radiate, we attract, we surely can achieve. Let's change the narrative two for two. So this evening we have a special guest, one who is the top results. A stranger to any of us, but he has a wealth of knowledge and can lead us through a walk down uh, history lane and helping us to identify identity. And so we welcome to the show, um, Mr. Chris Omoshango Davis. Thank you, thank you. Here on the screen. Great to be here, great to be here. <laughs> yes, yes, we, we love to have you here. Um, we, we're all about addressing the novice and the, the novel and the things that are different. And and surely you fit as a, as a citizen of this land and enlightening us and educating us in ways that many of us have a perspective that we never even con would thought to consider to look down that road in the way we look at our history and our past. It's sometimes matched history and past, but most of the time it's all different because of the way people write it isn't necessarily what it really was. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, that's for yeah. sure. Yes. So, Chris, the, uh, if I can call you that, the, you're a researcher. You yep. did some history, um, interpretations, and then you're a storyteller. You're an author um, and a project manager. You want to tell us a deep dive into some of the other things? Yeah, man. Well, my day job, I actually work for the Antiquities, Monuments, and Museum Corporation. So okay. many people know me from interacting with me at the Pompey Museum right there mm -hmm. downtown. For those that don't know, that's the first building when you get on Bay Street. Well, the second building technically on your left, the big pink pretty building with the lovely uh, artistry on it. You know, and right. that's where I work in. I've been working there going on eight years now. But even prior to my job getting there, and a part of the reason I got the job there was because I've always been kind of a freelance researcher. And me getting into this uh, in-depth historical research was something that kind of happened organically for me. Um, all my adult life, you know, I was always questioning and inquisitive and started to uh, realize certain things about myself and then about my family and then about my community, then about the country and then about all of us uh, who call ourselves, quote unquote, uh, black, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so something, I wouldn't even call it my passion. I would say it's become an obsession almost, you know, and um, I spend a lot of my uh, waking time uh, doing research, uh, reading up on stuff, and even just sitting down to myself and pondering um, all of the things that you uh, so gracefully put forth in the introduction, right? And I'm also a project manager. I did that with uh, Lignum Institute. Okay. Um, and I, I actually have found ways to incorporate uh, project management with my historical research um, in general, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm also a storyteller. And I recently um, completed my first book. It's in the process of editing and all of these different things now. And I'm also working on my second book, mm -hmm. some of which I will get into um, as we um, continue our talk about our origins and, and things of that nature. Right. And so it's just something I've always been passionate about. Um, my family is also uh, very uh, history-centered as mm -hmm. well, um, and it's not only been an academic and a professional journey for me, it's also even been a spiritual journey for me. And so, um, 
yeah, it's been a very, very short journey in comparison to most others. But um, I spent a lot of time uh, researching now, and I actually thoroughly enjoy it as well. Well, we could see that in your work. Uh, it comes up that you are having fun. And don't mind the time that you've been in it, the content and the quality of content from what I've been exposed to uh, has a lot of uh, merit to and a lot of value. Um, so hats off to you. Uh, I would you, say tip my hair, but I, you know, that's one of those things that I don't have the blessings of you to have <laughs> hair on the face and hair on the hair and hair, all those things. So those things disappeared sometime. Uh, uh, Ah, um, worry, man. You still, you still look young, you know. You're looking yeah. young, so you're looking, you're looking good, you're straight. <laughs> well, I try to. Some people try to keep me young too. So, right. <laughs> when, when we look, when we look at this whole thing now, um, this show is sponsored by Dom Dev Enterprises and Page Investment Limited, and we have friends who like to join us and and like. And so we have Islandese Realty, D1 Development, and Sammy's Chicken, who all okay. um, be a part of our, our family of sorts. And so right. when we look at what we're trying to do here now and, and what we want to talk about tonight in terms of particularly the, um, our identity. Um, I always say to people, um, based on my limited knowledge and exposure to the Bible and the like, that we all came from the Africa area. When you say came from, but you could define that as came coming from or of the Africa or whatever words you would put. Done because mm -hmm. there's different meanings to that. But the my understanding is all colors come from black. Yeah, yeah. Uh, only light, all colors come from white light. Um, it's broken out from that. But everything else, it's black is the composite of all. So mm -hmm. when we say um, these things, really and truly, even though we have the separation of powers from the persons with, with darker hues and those with, with lily whites. They all yeah. came from the same, right? right. I mean, that, right. That's the way I look at it. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, there's power in the name. And so, you know, I can't go beyond the step here without you having to explain to us how or where or whichever you got the name Omo Shango. Oh, well, Omo Shango, very simply put, it just means son of Shango. Shango is one of the most popular um, kings, deities, depending on how you look at it, that comes out of West Africa. You see him even in northern Ghana, where I just came from, actually, but not specifically the north, but I've met people from there. Um, but it's more closely linked um, to the Yoruba people from mm -hmm. present day uh, southern Nigeria, southwestern Nigeria, western Nigeria. And as a matter of fact, among the Yoruba people, or Yoruba, some people know it as Yoruba, but I think the proper way is Yoruba. Um, okay. Those are actually one of the largest groups of Africans that came directly to the Bahamas, not only in the transatlantic slave trade, but even after the slave trade was abolished and were then uh, settled here in the Bahamas. We mm -hmm. put it into context, um, when our population was somewhere around uh, 20 to 25,000 people, on one day, over 1,000 um, formerly enslaved or would-be enslaved Africans landed here in New Providence, um, and most of whom were from the Yoruba people. You understand the ship, both ships actually came directly from Lagos, mm -hmm. which is a kind of unofficial capital of the Yoruba people, uh, even to this day. And for those of you who like the new trend in Afrobeats, you know, the vast majority of those Nigerian Afrobeats artists uh, come from Lagos as okay. well. Mm -hmm. And so Shango represents justice. Um, you have something called syncretism, um, mm -hmm. whereas in many of the African faiths, they actually believe that all of these different religions are just different manifestations at different times of the same energies, the same deities. And so mm -hmm. Shango is often associated with Elijah because he's also um, responsible for fire, justice, lightning, thunderstorms. Um, he is known for having a very deep voice, known for being athletic, but there are certain stereotypes and he is often associated with uh, St. Barbara. And mm -hmm. if you know the story of uh, St. Barbara, she was unfortunate to have a very uh, cruel father and her father somewhere along the lines tried to essentially sell her into sexual slavery and before the deal could be done, as he walked outside, um, he was struck by lightning. And according to the story, that was because she was protected. And that is also why Shango being one of the popular African deities who also deals with the element of lightning and electricity. Mm -hmm. um, Tony McKay actually pays homage to him all the time. And if you had a 
know, his most popular song, The Obia Man. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, and he says, I came down on a lightning bolt, nine months in my mama's belly. When I was born, the midwife scream and shout, I had fire and brimstone coming out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's all uh, symbolic from his point of view. But it all talks about um, this um, West African deity known as uh, Shango. Um, and when I've done my travels, when I've been to certain places, um, a lot of the uh, people that practice are, are familiar with Shango. Um, they often associate me with him, um, mm -hmm. and it's something I'm grateful for. And I just mm -hmm. adopted the name essentially as the son of Shango, right? Yeah, but I, I wish we should have we should have kept a picture of of a Shang, Shango who we saw yeah. on, because then people could have seen why they um, <laughs> um, comparing you to the, to him. Because right, you know, there there are some based on the, the pictorials, there are some resemblances yeah. in the like. And who knows? I don't know. Maybe they they crown you or. or no man ain't a, ain't a crown. As a matter of fact, in the in the world of Yoruba religious philosophy or spirituality or Yoruba culture, as you mm -hmm. would put it, um, Shango is actually considered, for lack of a use of a better term, the patriot saint of Trinidad. And, you know, in Trinidad, they have a religion called Shango Baptist, which oh. is essentially an infusion of what I just spoke about um, with Christianity. You know, mm -hmm. and um, it existed here in the Bahamas too, and it's obvious. Obviously, because we still have things like ASU, which right. is directly derived from the Yoruba people. Um, and we even do things the same way that they do it still to this day in Nigeria. Well, in my experience, I find that when men control ASU, it's not as successful as when women tend to do it. And you usually mm -hmm. realize that women are typically the ones uh, to do ASU draws. And that's a culture that comes directly from the Yoruba people. And it's not just in the Bahamas. You can see the interconnectedness with a place like Jamaica. And words that we even adopted via Jamaica, things mm -hmm. like everything Irie. Right. Irie actually comes from the Yoruba word ire, which means blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you say everything mm -hmm. Irie, you mean, yeah, man, I feel blessed. You know, I feel mm -hmm. good. Yeah. 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 Well, folks out there, um, welcome also to um, something to think about with their happy notes. Um, you're wel quite welcome to add your comments and your questions online, um, whether on YouTube or Facebook, however you're watching. Be sure to tell us what part of the world you're watching from. It brings some character to the show and also give us content, uh, context as to maybe the basis behind some of your questions. And the like, um, um, Moshango is going to take us down a walk today um, yes. where many of us have not been before, yeah. right? Um, at least we're going to try to push him to go to that point and so forth. And to get it kicked off, uh, we have, um, now you have to pronounce this last name, uh, um, um, Chris, on this because uh, I know you talked about Alex in another video some time ago and yeah, Alex Alex and, and, and the rest. Mm -hmm. But yeah. he says, Fire, 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 greetings from oh, yeah. um, folks, folks, folks. Oh, so. oh, yeah. Now, let's mm -hmm. see if I could get right into it there, you know. Mm -hmm. And the last, the last show I did, another show I actually uh, mentioned, Alex Kofi. And for those that don't know, Alice Kofi um, is one of my close contacts. I consider him a brother now. Mm -hmm. uh, the place is known as Princess Town, but we're trying to change it back to Pakistan. Even though, of course, there are many African princesses that right. live in this town, many of whom who I met, you know, all the girls, all the school kids and all that, you know, it's just a beautiful place. But what's so interesting about Pakistan and my brother Alex, uh, Alex is actually an oral historian, about mm -hmm. the same age as me. He's from Pakistan. And much of the information that I got on Jian Kuo, mm -hmm. who, who we know as John Canoe, who is the namesake of our most precious um, intrinsic value here in the Bahamas known as John Canoe. Mm -hmm. You know, Alex is a brother of mine. He's an oral historian. And I hope that by the end of this, it will galvanize Bahamians, Jamaicans, people from Belize, Guyanese, right. Surinamese, right. all mm -hmm. of these people that are actually connected to John Canoe and Pakasu um, to actually go and visit. You know, because um, they're in the process of building a very strong heritage tourism product over there. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the people are already built for it. You know, um, they're extremely yeah. friendly. And I felt right at home, feel like I was, you know, in Kid Island or, or something like that when I, yeah, when I went right. there, you know, and it was it was wonderful. But most importantly, this is where the man that we know as John Canoe was from. Mm -hmm. And when I discuss our roots, I think culturally, when I when I explain who this man Jian Kuo was, John Kuo right. was, it will give us a better understanding of who we are, particularly.
Kofi as it pertains um, essentially Parker Sioux, where Alice Kofi is from, um, is where John Canoe was the chief. And he was not just a chief, he was a warrior, a general, a merchant. And the more I study about Parker Sioux, the Ahanta people, which is the group that John Canoe is from. Now the Ahanta numbered tens of millions of people 200 years ago. And because mm -hmm. of their fight, their almost constant fight against the transatlantic slave trade and colonization, their numbers have dwindled to um, far below 4 million today. However, mm -hmm. they have a very, very, very vibrant culture over there in Western Ghana. And Jan Kwa was essentially this warrior who represented the vanguard, not just for the Ahanta people, but the Nzima people, the Ga people, the Wasa people, even a few Iwe people now that we're um, discovering were mm -hmm. all involved in his army. And his army was used to unequivocally fight against the transatlantic slave trade. And of course, for those who have been following my research thus far, um, I just returned from Ghana last week, Monday, where along with our research, my uh, wife Tamara, with mm -hmm. the help of uh, Alice Kofi, who is watching right now, um, we actually carried out an outreach initiative. It was very small to begin with, but uh, we feel that it will grow and grow. And right. time with us building this hair tourism product, because in a nutshell, the Ahanta people, Jian Kuao is another king, King Bontu II, and why we named our parade after this man, why his name survived, and, and we have so many African kings and queens. Why was it his name that, that was attached to this? And this man, as I said, was an absolutely incredible historical figure. And him, along with all of the Ahanta people and the Nzima people, actually, they represent a history in Africa that we can be very proud of. Mm -hmm. And then you also see how both the British and the Dutch kind of appropriated this story and the story behind the mind of who John Canoe was. And then it just became this nice celebration. You even have reports of people saying that we were actually doing it um, to mimic <laughs> uh, our slave masters. Mm -hmm. when, when you realize who Jian Kua was, you realize that it was not really a mimicry, but these were actually reenactments of battles and feats that Jian Kua had um, accomplished against the British and the Dutch. And he mm -hmm. held out in the fort that's right there in Parkasu, known as Cross Friedrichsburg. Um, he held out there for over eight years. Mm -hmm. Some will tell you over 20 years, depending on how you look at the complex politics in the area, right? But I'll stop right there because I want to get into more yeah. of it a little yeah. later, right? Yeah. Well, shout outs to um, Holly down there um, presently in Barbados. Holly is a, a, a art icon in, in this region. Um, and um, Leslie, who's on the screen just now, is. Um, one of our film um, gurus, um, and you know, I'm sure you would be aware of those. Um, both of them are very esteemed persons. We thank you for tuning in with us. And, and then there's Kay Francis, of all means. Now, one of the things I touched on in, in the scripting for the show, uh, the notice of invite was I mentioned Africa, Haiti, and Cuba, um, and, and the idea of gaslighting, but um. It wasn't meant to just be Africa, Haiti, and Cuba, because I have a view that we're all interconnected somehow. But uh, Haiti and Cuba in particular had major revolutions in my mind that had a major impact. And obviously Africa um, was, <clears throat> excuse me, where everything started out um, and everything went blossom from there. So this idea about whether they are gaslighting us, right, yeah. or, or the effect of gaslighting and the like. Um, the modern producer, if you want to put up the, the script for gaslighting so more visitors, uh, guests can, and audience can understand what Reb, uh, Miriam Webster defines it as. But basically, it's, it's an idea of manipulating people so that they could think something different than what was, if I could summarize, summarize that in, in its in form. We could leave that there for a second. So Chris, from your perspective and your experience in all of your research so far, of all the stories that we teach in schools today and, and what we've been over the last, what is that now? It's, it's almost 700 years, eh? you know, six, 400 years, 500 years, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, how far off is what compared to what is real? And then we can break down what is real. Well, from, you mean from the Bahamian perspective or from the global perspective? Because I could comment on both. From what we are being taught in the Bahamas in particular, but right. now that the Bahamas is, well, let me not just say the Bahamas, but the, this region, because 
there's a lot of commonality for this region. Right. Yeah, most definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've had discussions with many people throughout the Caribbean, many of my uh, Pan-African counterparts, if you will, mm -hmm. um, who are pretty much dealing with very similar issues. So when you look at places like Grenada, Dominica, um, Barbados, you know, um, they have a very similar historical narrative to us. Mm -hmm. But for us, in my view, um, it's slightly worse uh, because particularly when you look at the way, for example, that we view the loyalists, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and which Rogers, I'll touch on both. So the loyalists firstly, and I'll work my way back. But when you look at the loyalists arriving here, um, the, the population of the Bahamas was essentially about one to one white to black. When the loyalists arrived there, I think it increased to something like six to one or seven to one. Mm -hmm. Right. Furthermore, about 45% about of all people of color, black and all those things in between, we can get into the construct mm -hmm. of race too, right? right. But those who are at risk of being enslaved, if you will, there was about 45%. And mm -hmm. after um, the loyalists arrived, that percentage doubled. And so we are taught to praise the loyalists. You know, We are taught that Lord John Rule was this absentee slave owner and all of these things. We are taught that there was no appreciable profits made um, from our enslavement. All of these things uh, that I, I can confidently tell you are blatant uh, lies. And not that the people that put those things there did it with the intention tension of lying because obviously right. we are the ones who kind of perpetuate these things. However, it is the result of the same gaslighting uh, that you say. And I appreciate that you bring up um, the Haitian revolution in the 20th century and then the Haitian revolution in the 19th century, right. because I actually always argue that despite our supposed lack of appreciation of our African roots, Mm -hmm. Even though our John Canoe Parade is evidence against that, I would right. I would I would say, but even though our stereotypical lack of appreciation for African roots, we have to understand that we shouldn't look at the past with a 21st century mindset. And this mm -hmm. is also a part of that uh gaslighting. And so we were surround we surrounded by the three, three of the worst examples or three quintessential examples of what happens when people of color, people of African descent, Africans, black people, or everyone to look at it. Right can't even the slightest victory, you know? So in the United States, of course, you see what happens in places like Tucson and, and these black Wall Streets that are destruct, um, pretty much destroyed. We right. see what's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement. Cuba had their revolution, a communist socialist revolution, which is where many of um, the African leaders were trying to lean, you understand? Right. And we see the result of the embargoes that were placed on Cuba. Then, of course, Haiti is arguably the best example of, of this gas lighting because a people that we really should praise and and um, commend, uh, we actually are conditioned to hate. You mm -hmm. understand? And when you even go back to the slave trade, it's no coincidence that the Haitian Revolution was won in 1804, and then the bill to end the slave trade was passed the year after, and then mm -hmm. it came into an act in 1807, and then it actually ended in 1808, not 1807, but they, for some reason, love to add those little extra years on there. And the Haitian Revolution was central to the ending of the slave trade. And people don't realize that even like Simon Bolivar, who they call the great liberator, mm -hmm. when he met um, with the Haitian emperor at the time, I believe who was Henri Christophe, Henri Christophe said, okay, we will help you. But the first thing you gotta do is prove this. You understand? Mm -hmm. um, just to scan over it quickly, you could almost pinpoint where Haitian xenophobia began in the Bahamas, you know. If okay. you go back to April 1795, this was right after the British were expelled from Haiti at an area in the northwestern extremity known as Mole St. Nicholas. Y'all could Google it, Wikipedia, if you mm -hmm. want. But the thing is, you could actually see the fires from that revolution in Inagua at the time. Right. And leading up to that, you had all of these Bahamian so-called British privateers who were, quote unquote, sacking French ships and also taking their property. Mm -hmm. Now, this was so common that the transatlantic slave trade and the intra-American slave trade actually lessened during this period because the influx of enslaved Af African people from Haiti was so strong at the time for almost 10 years. So mm -hmm. side note, no Bahamian of African descent or a white Bahamian could claim that they have pure blue blood, Bahamian blood, and don't have any right. Haitian ancestry. Now we can put that on the side. In 1795, before, before you leave that, though, yeah, that's a critical point because you know, right. we, we have this xenophobia about people in our region, and oh, yeah, and, and yeah. I really believe that 
that we came through some special boat or speed <laughs> or chariot of fire from the sky or something. Yeah. I don't know what it is that we believe, yeah. right? But, yeah. uh, you know, to me, even the Haitians and the, the Cubans in particular, I mean, I, and I only focus on those two because if you call yeah. them, yeah. 30 o'clock in the night. But um, what they put on the table and to allow us to do and coming into our own emancipation and the rest. They they said that tsunami roll it. And oh, that's yeah. my view. I mean, I don't know oh, if you yeah. share that yeah. same view. A hundred percent, right? A hundred percent. And for freedom all over, like with Simon Bolivar, like I was saying, about half of his troops were made up of Haitian soldiers. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's known as the great liber liberator of South America. So even in parts of the Caribbean, but any South American country with the yellow blue and red in their flag, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, and of mm -hmm. course, uh, Bolivia. You know, these were nations that were quote unquote liberated and slavery was ended by Simon Bolivar, but they don't tell you that the vast significant part of his troops were made up of Haitian soldiers. Right. right? Um, and so that's one of the biggest parts of it. You know, they are the greatest liberators and there's no coincidence that everywhere you see that Africans fight and actually won certain victories um, for their freedom, that you also see that these are some of the more underdeveloped parts of the world. And we have our history and our roots and our DNA is inextricably linked with that of both Cuba and Haiti. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So once we have that scenario in, in mind and concept and, and thought, um, but then let's go back a little, I guess, I say a little further back. There was this man called Columbus who was supposedly. Uh, yeah. Um, discovered us, right? Uh, I'd say he discovered the fact that he was lost and he figured out that there's something else out there versus what he thought right. was out there. So there's this view that, you know, he wiped out everybody in, in the Bahamas. And I have this view that some of the Taino Indians and the like went to different places and mm -hmm. scattered because they got here from somewhere at some point. Uh, if everybody right. started in Africa, they had to come here. So it's not oh, yeah. like they were yeah. just already here and then didn't know how to go nowhere else. Right. And so I have friends who I went to school with who said that some of them went to Cuba and then uh, the like, and maybe even came back. And there was always this big trade um, scenario with the Southern Bahamas in the right. Nagua area and Ragged Island and the rest with Cuba and Haiti. Right. And so I'm just thinking that there's a lot of cross pollination, for lack of a better word. Yeah, that's the right. That's yeah. what. Yeah, I think that's what. Um, well, he partially shared the same view mm -hmm. because definitely and and especially knowing that they knew the line, you know, these were people like you and me. Mm -hmm. um, God forbid if somebody came to the Bahamas today and started doing the same thing, a lot of us would definitely be leaving to save mm -hmm. ourselves and our family. However, um, and I got this information uh, from Dr. Michael Pateman, a uh, Bahamian archaeologist who I personally consider one of the foremost experts on Lucayan. So when I have a question about it, he is one of the guys I reach out to, okay. you know, um, and also Dr. Grace Turner as, as well, who is the head of research at AMMC. Um, and both of them have uh, informed me uh, that they haven't actually been finding any at all Lucayan DNA, which mm -hmm. is distinct from that of the Tainos in Cuba, even though it's very okay. closely related. And so it points to several possibilities from my interpretation, either that Columbus's visit here was far more brutal. You have mm -hmm. to mention people like Ponce de Leon because Ponce de Leon came after Columbus and right. did much of the same thing. Um, or maybe those that ran away and got away were just so few that over time, you know, the DNA just kind of, I don't know right. if it's yeah. actually, I'm not a Why geologist. But, right, you understand what I'm saying, mm -hmm. a genealogist story, but, you know, but over time, you know, but the fact that we can't find a speck of Lucayan DNA mm -hmm. um, speaks volumes to the level of horror that they probably experienced. Um, right now, you could Google all of Columbus's diaries. Um, you also have people that were in his crew that there's a man in particular named Rodrigo de Triana, who I find very interesting. He was mm -hmm. the first man to spot land. And um, in my interpretation, he was actually an African as well. Uh, and he came to the New World with Columbus as a Catholic. Um, and he was so disgusted and perturbed um, by what he what had happened. He when he moved back to Spain, he excommunicated himself from the Catholic Church and mm -hmm. moved down to present day Mali to become a Muslim. 
and I don't see a European fellow <laughs> doing <laughs> something like that at that period of time in history, right? Mm -hmm. But Columbus Swingham, as we would say in the Bahamas, because he was mm -hmm. the first man that um, spotted land, and then Columbus pretty much like, no, I spotted it first, you know? So he was right. a real swindler. Of course, we have to be careful not to, to, to give all of the blame for what happened in Lucas to him because there were others that followed that also did a lot of damage. But of mm -hmm. course, he was the one that opened the door. When you read his diaries, it's very, very perplexing and it's difficult for those who don't have a proper mind for historical interpretation because he genuinely believed that he was ordained by God to come and do these things to these people. Oh, Columbus. That, oh yeah, he, he genuinely believed that. And most people who um, read into it, either he genuinely he believed it or the gymnastics to convince himself of that to justify all of the horrors um, that they were doing you know because there was a papal bull passed by the catholic church um pope nicholas v if i'm not mistaken but it was in 1452 june of 1452 named down the verses which was latin for until different and that was the papal bull that was passed that gave all european christians the right to enslave and to place in perpetual servitude to quote the document Right. Perpetual servitude. So you, your children, your grandchildren, all of y'all, mm -hmm. once you're son of harm or you're sacred, meaning you're Muslim or you ain't a Christian, they allowed to do that. And this is what set the precedence. And this was 40 years before Columbus landed here. Right. So he came armed with this, you know, and that was the psychology. Now, men like Pizarro, for example, who was in South America, I don't believe, truly believe that. I believe he was just a straight up evil man. But I believe that Columbus believed that he was somehow <laughs> ordained by God to do all of these atrocities. And I'm not mm -hmm. making it. I'm just, you know, and, and even though, of course, it might have been a subconscious justification, but he's not a man that should be celebrated. But at the same time, I wish that the guy that destroyed the statue would have did it with a little more of a political fervor, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Not um, knocking him and what he did. Of course, I'm sure many people are happy that it was done to a certain degree. But I just wish that it was done with more political decorum and saying, putting, contextualizing Columbus more. Even though I sympathize with him reaching his breaking point. And it's interesting that he targeted the Columbus statue as the symbol for um, you know, lashing out to him yeah. reaching mm -hmm. his breaking point. Yeah. yeah. When we had Dr. Nicolette Bethel on the show, and we talked a little bit about that in terms of also um, whether stuff like the lockdowns and the rest of those inspired or, or motivated yeah. um, behavior beyond what we considered normal. Um, yeah, I think, like, right? yeah. But I think, I think Columbus really should go um, because he is a part of our past and mm -hmm. stuff at the head of the, um, at the harbor. Um, right. where out of our sight, but inside of the tourists, so that they could mm -hmm. um, have fun looking at him and saying, "Oh, this yeah. and all that and stuff," and give us their money and whatever. And then, but we're not affected by it. I mean, that's right. just my thoughts on it. So yeah. when we look at this whole thing, though, wasn't there the Chinese? I mean, when we watch these old kung fu movies and stuff like that, you see the Chinese and the rest of them going from way, 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 way back in history. And the fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Were they before, after, or in between uh, um, Columbus and those? Because they somehow, well, somehow we got from Africa to this part of the world. <laughs> and, yeah, they just skipped. Right. Yeah. But well, a big problem is the, the period of history. History in itself is very Eurocentric, even the way that they classify history and mm -hmm. these different periods, like the Bronze Age and the Stone Age and all that. Just know that most of that is actually centered around European history. Mm -hmm. Particularly when you look at the period they call the medieval period, the quote unquote dark ages, that actually represented a golden age for Africa. Okay. At the time, um, not the country, not the modern country of Ghana, but the kingdom of Ghana, for example, in the ten, in the ten hundreds, I guess, if you will. This was at a time when the Vikings and and King Rollo, you know, they show you the Viking show on Netflix and all the kingdoms right. when they was doing all that. And at this point, you know, we had um, cities like one, for example, is called Kumbi Sela. K H O U M B I S A L E H for those who want to Google it. And you could put that on the side of a page, a picture of ancient Egypt or any of the more well known um, ancient African cities, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, right? And um, the king at that time, he could summon over 100,000 people on land to battle. Mm -hmm. And there was a man named El Bakri who was actually from Spain, a Catholic man from Spain. And 
he was so taken aback by the level of gold and riches these fellas had. Like gold was like nothing to them. Mm -hmm. And he also um, questioned their manhood because of the level of political power that they allowed women to have in their mm -hmm. kingdom. Right. And he was actually ridiculing them for it. And in his ridiculing of them, he actually what he showed you was of society in the ten thousand in the ten hundreds in Africa that was more progressive than mm -hmm. early 20th century the United States of America, at least from a women's rights um, perspective. You know, so what was happening with us is usually overlooked. You also had Map and Gugwe, um, or Great Zimbabwe, as it's more commonly known, um, mm -hmm. which is south africa you know they even talk much about south africa right. zimbabwe actually means great house of stone and so and there were also people taken um from that region though only about two percent during the transatlantic slave trade um as well and of course mm -hmm. kombi sala um is right there in west africa you know and 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 those are the same people that migrated and that we now know as the akan people Right. Um, and their biggest group within them is known as the Ashanti people. And Ashanti mm -hmm. is because of war. So it's interesting um, to tie this into something else, how when people talk about um, the Ma'afa, if you will, meaning the beginning and the, um, of all of this oppression and slavery and colonization right. in Africa, usually you have so many differing times. You know, some people say 500 years. Some people say 400 years. Some people say 1,000 years. Some people say 4,000 years. Some people say 2,000 years. And mm -hmm. all of these dates, some dated to when the Hyksos first invaded ancient Egypt and Nubia. Some dated to um, when the Greeks and Hannibal and all of these people, um, mm -hmm. when you understand, and so you can mm -hmm. kind of get just a bit. Some dated to when the Arabs started to encroach and wipe out and commit genocides throughout North Africa, killing off the Berber and many other groups that were black, like quote unquote, black, like me and you, mm -hmm. but are now uh, mostly Arab and populated by Arab people. And, and you know, so, and then some people, of course, started from the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. It's a very complex issue, but um, it's interesting that you make that parallel because the Vikings and those were before the transatlantic slave trade, but they were not before the Arab slave trade. Right. Okay. And the Arab slave trade existed for at least uh, five, half a, set, half a millennium before the European one did, even though the European one was very unprecedented, extremely brutal, in every way, shape, or form, not negating the Arab slave trade, but mm -hmm. um, as a historian, and to be truthful, it was far more humane because you don't see any great African Christian kingdoms that were popping up in that time and space. You have Aksum, which was far before that. You know, you have um, certain parts of Egypt that were long before that. And then mm -hmm. you have the Kingdom of Congo that first contacted with the Portuguese. And even though they converted to Catholicism, they still were enslaved. You understand? And so, mm -hmm. but with the Muslims and the Islamics, you see great African Islamic kingdoms that rise and fall all throughout that period. And so that fact alone tells you that um, the Arabic slave trade, though brutal and still ongoing to this day, was not even comparable in many ways to the transatlantic mm -hmm. slave trade, which is what our um, ancestors right. suffered. Right. Yeah. So I hope um, persons were listening, particularly my brother and sister out there, because you said that, you know, I was a black like me and you, right? And, you know, they mm -hmm. always say I was the white boy, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but we can touch on that after after the break, which we can come up with in a couple of uh, minutes. But uh, before we get to that, though, um, two couple of things. One is the, you said that the Taino Indian and the Lakayan Indians were different, but they always talk about the Taino Indians being across the whole region. Right. How, how were they different? They were different a little bit in their DNA because there were several hundred years when the Lucayans kind of settled, and that's this is including Turks and Caicos too, by the way. Okay. What was called the Lucayos or the Lucayan archipelago, whatever right. you want to refer mm -hmm. to it as. And so for, yes, for a number yeah. of years, mm -hmm. they were different. Now, linguistically, they were probably very similar, but okay. you would almost think of it as the difference between a Bahamian and a Jamaican. Even though we are probably more closely related to them through our DNA coming from Africa, mm -hmm. however, you know there are certain differences that make us a distinct people from the Jamaican right. people, not from a Pan-African right. sense, but just from a geopolitical sense, from a linguistic sense, from a food mm -hmm. culture. You know, all of these things. You know, um, they good at they good at soccer. We good at basketball. You know, right. just little right. little mm -hmm. things like that, both trivial and uh, meaningful. Right. And so the other one was, I think it was Helen um, um, Bartlett 
um, Hannah asked the question earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Is this information being put in our schools? Um, yeah, no, sorry, but is, is the history built into our school curriculum? Not this history. Sorry, mm -hmm. not the not the one that I know of. I just saw my taken in the Bahamas book. And this way, I i mean, I got to ruffle some feathers here. Mm -hmm. You know, the book is written by Philip Cash. I don't know if anyone knows who Philip Cash was, but yeah. mm -hmm. Philip Cash, you know, all right. So I need mm -hmm. to get into it. And the school that he was associated with and the history of that school being a formerly segregated school. Right. And this book was written right during that, during that period. And we mm -hmm. still using it. Mm -hmm. In this book, Philip Cash claims that Governor Fenny was the one that started the straw making industry in the Bahamas. Governor mm -hmm. Fenny had a role to play, but the way that Governor Fenny, of course, he didn't start it. It was Africans that started it. Right. But the way that he, um, I would say, galvanized it was because he owned the first slave ship that came here from Ghana. Right. Philip Cash knew that, but he didn't want to say that. What he can tell you is, oh, he they start. He he is the one who started the straw industry. He ain't gonna tell you the man was a slave trader. And they ain't gonna tell you that Woods Rogers was a slave trader, you know. And they make it seem like us coming under colonial fold was a good thing. But it's not in our curriculums. And they mention these fellas and what we have in Bahamian schools for the most part, though it is beginning to change, um, more so at the behest of some of the great teachers that, that we have, you know. But essentially what we have in the Bahamas is European history in the Bahamas. And most people think history is just listing off the governors. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I see history, um, listen off the governor saying which loyalist was the nicest one today, slaves and all that. People calling William Wiley and calling James Carmichael Smith abolitionists and all type of foolishness. Mm -hmm. you know? When we have people who fought and died for us, we even had a ruined societies here in the Bahamas, but I can I can keep that one to myself for this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to bring you, me back for that one. <laughs> at the rate we go in, um, I, I want to quarter to read through my questions and already <laughs> almost at an hour, so um Whoa, wow, that, wow, that, wow. that might be the case they're gonna happen but um let me ask this question there so did we come from or of these places oh I mean, yeah i've heard these words put to me in a in a session that i was at with historians talking and they said there's a difference and even some religion religious people saying there's a difference between coming from and being of um uh, mm -hmm. See, well, I can speak frankly right there too. That, mm -hmm. in my view, is just an, a result of the same gaslighting that you talk about. And what they should ask themselves, I don't mean mm -hmm. to insult anybody, let's look at history honestly and truthfully. Mm -hmm. The side that call themselves the Christians okay. were the ones doing all the raping, all the mm -hmm. enslaving, all the killing, mm -hmm. all making all the money from all of this stuff. And the people who they claim because I heard that statement before too, and they meant it um, in the context of how Africans worship, how Africans practice spirituality and all of that stuff. I don't know if who you spoke to meant it in that same context, but- Yeah, I'm not sure know, how they meant it, but that's what right. they, they said. You know, but that's usually the context is, is meant in. And you have to ask yourself, how is it that they who call themselves Christians and the ones who follow Jesus and the ones who do all this stuff, they committing all the murders, all the rapes, and the ones They claim victims of sad murder, rapes, and somehow mm -hmm. we've been gaslighted into thinking that the ones getting killed is the evil ones. And the ones who proclaim just because they get Jesus on the tip of their tongue and the tip of their mouth, all of a sudden they're the good ones. So I can do anything to anybody, but if I call Jesus' name, <laughs> yeah. that make, it makes me good. Come on, mm -hmm. man. Gotta get, um, yeah. Real, you know, and that, let me, just, I'll just pose another very obvious question. If two poodles, no, let me put it another way. If two pit bulls mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. has puppies in a mm -hmm. poodle kennel, are they poodles or are they pit bulls? Are they poodles or are they pit bulls? If, um, if me yeah. and my wife is a poodle, is mm -hmm. a pit bull, sorry, mm -hmm. and we leave where the pit bull to a poodle's kennel mm -hmm. and we have puppies, those puppies are still pit bulls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. two rabbits, if you put, I can use a quote from my one of my favorites, Dr. Ben. If you take two rabbits and put it in the oven, and mm -hmm. those rabbits have little baby bunnies, do you call those baby bunnies biscuits? I heard that one before. Yeah, so, right. Uh, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So yeah. that that's just that's just um, an attempt to disassociate ourselves with Africa. Because we believe that Africa is wrong and it's this and it's that, you know, and I, you know, we got to move past that, man. 
you know, and, and especially when you realize that even within the Bible, for those that believe or don't believe, you know, most of the historical figures in the Bible are African, the ones that you could actually point to. The Queen of Sheba is Empress Makeda, Ethiopia. Right. General Tahaka, the liberator of Jerusalem, but they don't talk about these in churches for some reason. You mm -hmm. know, and if Jesus was in quote unquote block, he was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is at the gateway of Europe, the gateway yep. of Asia, and the mm -hmm. gateway to Africa. So if Herod and his navy and his army and all these police and all these people looking for the new baby Jesus, why would you send a white, blonde hair, blue eyed baby to go hide in Africa? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Why not send him to Rome? Yeah, there's you know? a lot of illogical yeah. things that people have, um, and right. we tend to like to write our history, right? Uh, <laughs> um, to suit our needs versus what it is, and that's why I always say yeah. to my brother when we have these discussions that there is past, the past, and then there is history, and history to me is man's story or his story. Um, that's the way I look at it. Somebody who. Uh, let me tell you about this gentleman here. His name Dale Shallow, Dale, Dale Shallow on the screen there. All right, all right. I don't know if you know him, but uh, he and I are born one day apart. Wow. Right? We were in the same <laughs> class at school. And and so sometimes the teachers used to get mixed up as to what they wanted to call call people. But um, but he's also uh, sort of a historian himself um, or would like to be a historian because we say that. Um, well, yeah, I can say that's my classmate. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean... He doesn't do it full time like you or, or the like, but uh, I'm sure he's well in, in good. He's a big jungle man and so forth. So, but um, yes, he talked here about um, Mr. Philip Cash and the like, uh, being a teacher and all of that kind of stuff. But when I look at this whole picture now, coming out of the majority rule movement and, and the like, uh, it brings me right back to this last question I have before we go to the break and then we could decide some things. Would be is that. Uh, two questions is are we really behemoths <laughs> well in the bahamas but of course the see the problem is people don't know what mm -hmm. being bahamian being jamaican being from the united states being canadian being um english being mm -hmm. um dutch you know geopolitical loyalty has nothing to do with your biology <laughs> you know mm -hmm. you have certain countries where of course there are certain ethnicities that are represented but mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with your biology and your ethnicity right so a chinese person could move from china today come to the bahamas fall in love with the bahamas and say but i don't want to be chinese no more and he can mm -hmm. burn his chinese passport and if we accept him and if he able to get his bahamian passport he is now a bahamian Right. And this is what leads to some of the xenophobia as well. And it's not negating what Bahamianness is per se. You just have to understand what it is. It is your geopolitical loyalty. So in simple terms, God ain't make the Bahamas. So if you don't remember some Turks and Caicos, you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, what you could say God made is you, your ethnicity, your biology, and your genetic makeup, which is different than your geopolitical state. You understand mm -hmm. your geopolitical loyalty, I, I should say. And so I wouldn't go so far to say as there's no such thing as a Bahamian. But when you put it into that context, and then you also put it in the, into the context of not the events of independence, to quote people like Dr. Curry and Ian Mora and all them, you know, um, independence is a shout out, is a, is a, is a, is a process, right. Mm -hmm. right? And it's not just this singular event. And when we realize all of that, this is why questions that you raise have to be raised, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not just a question for the Bahamas. It's also a question for Ghana. It's also right. a question for Jamaica. You know, Sizzler, the the, the popular um, reggae great. artist, have a song mm -hmm. called Freedom Cry. And in the end of that song, from a Pan-African standpoint, he say, hey, down in the West, me, I, I ain't gonna fly, no fly with no X. And he mm -hmm. made it, I know Jamaican, I, I African before I'm anything. I'm yes. African before I'm a Davis. I'm mm -hmm. African before I'm a Bahamian. Because every single one of those things are social constructs. Even though the term African is a social construct to a degree, but it speaks to my ethnicity and my biology, how mm -hmm. God made me in layman's terms. You understand? Right. So I hope I answered the question, but it's geopolitical sure. loyalty. You know, it's not 
the ethnicity and people, boy, are you get Haitian blood in you, you get Jamaican blood and you know, it's, it's yeah. all foolishness, right? Yeah, yeah, because I mean, doc, um, I think it's doctor, I don't know if he's doctor, Neil Ellis, Bishop Neil Ellis, and I think it's Farrakhan also both spoke mm -hmm. to, to that um, right. process that you just spoke of before. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, Madam Patusi, put the one back up from Leslie Vanderpool just now. Um, why are you so laughing just now? Um, sometimes, <laughs> you know, my name is Happy, so I, I can't always control myself. But uh, Leslie say, please bring Chris back. We <laughs> need a whole week. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I thought you need to get that, uh, that kudos yes. there from, from there. Thank you. Go to, to the break where we'll make a decision or two on some things here. The, uh, and ask this last question is that are we who we say we are? I would answer that with a yes and a no. Mm -hmm. See, this way our culture and heritage come in. Culturally, we are who we say we are because culture is really what you do every day, all day. Okay. So that includes the bad, the good, and the bad. Now, heritage is where we go wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, they had this recent craze of people actually doing their DNA. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been I actually did one of the memes myself, but there's been several memes going all around the world uh, where you have uh, people of African descent, you know, and they'd be like 80 percent all over Africa, 5 percent right. indigenous American, 15 percent Scottish. And actually, you know, the fella going to Scotland wearing a kilt and eating haggis. You know, this mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, but I just like to use simplified analogies for people. You know, if you have a basket right. of apples. You understand and that and that basket of 20 apples 18 mm -hmm. of those apples are red and two are green right you know you can't say that that's a basket of green apples right you could more so say that it's a basket of red apples mm -hmm. but then you could also acknowledge yeah but two up two green apples in there right. you understand right. what I'm saying? And that's mm -hmm. that's what it is but again it's that even the quote that you mentioned earlier is that inherent need to separate ourselves from africa because of what is associated with africa Mm -hmm. And, you know, we love to say that we are a Christian nation and all of that. And along the lines through African customs, spirituality, things, and even and we still do it, you know. And so that's that's what I find so funny. Like, mm -hmm. things like Bush Medicine, you could read the Obi Act. Right. And if you do it, and if you drink Sorcy, you mm -hmm. practice it under the okay. British law, mm -hmm. Obi Act, because mm -hmm. it's safe even for restoring a person to health. Mm -hmm. And while we was deprived of, um, medicine, even though I actually wrote a paper about how African medicine has always been superior um, to European medicine up until the early 20th century, at least, mm -hmm. you know, um, and essentially that's what it was. So you use in bush medicine to heal, heal yourself through the eyes of the British. That was obia and voodoo, mm -hmm. you know, and so. Again, practicing ASU, even things that we do in certain churches, you know, friendly, these are things, you know, people that, you know, certain churches are more vibrant than others. You have something called executive possession that is distinctly African. Right. Yeah, people catching the spirit that is distinctly African, so you could run from it all you want. It in right. us. Right. It's Valley Boy, but I'll admit. When the Saxons come down, if they sound good, I can yeah, bounce. You start rocking. Yeah. I can start rocking, and I can, mm -hmm. I can, I can still hate and talk about them bad, but I can still be rocking while I do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's certain things that are just in us. The way we speak, mm -hmm. words like tingham, you know, the, the, the cadence that we speak in, the syntax that we speak in. You know, we don't speak broken English. We speak Gullah and Geechee. Right. And Gullah and Geechee is also shared by the people on the United States, the United States southeastern States, right. seaboard. Mm -hmm. And that comes from places like Liberia, Angola, the Igbo and the Yoruba of, of, of Nigeria, you know? Mm -hmm. So we are African and again, you can deny it all you want, but it's in us. The way we dance, the way we move, the music that we make, the food that we make, mm -hmm. they get jollof rice all over West Africa, peas and rice all over West Africa, right. okra and rice all over West Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eating fish, stew fish with dipping all type of dough and thing inside the fish all over West Africa. Come on, man, yeah. stew yeah. fish yeah. and Johnny cake. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a popular dish these days. Quote um, Ronnie Butler. <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, you've been listening to something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. We're here with uh, Chris um, <clears throat> Omo Shango Davis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the man who travels all the way to Gambia. He has a lot of things on his plate right now. We look forward to um, people like Leslie, um, those 
finding ways to help him put some of these in video. Um, oh, yeah, video I'm just talking about. Up, maybe I'm just talking about this kind of video. Well, we can yeah. talk off air about that because I actually yeah. have some things and emotions right now. So okay, awesome. if you're all interested. Yeah, yeah. So we we gonna um we gotta pay the piper and let the um, sponsors be seen, and then we're gonna come back and um, by then we will decide um, how we move forward. Okay, right? Madam Producer. Sammy's Chicken. There's nothing like it. ID store, God of 242 Elite. And I just want to tell y'all all about our great experience crossing Orlando this past month. Uh, we had some fundraisers. We want to thank everyone for reaching out to us. We want to send a special mm -hmm. thank you to our Coach D. And I know he really did well looking after us for the past month. Everything that we did, it was awesome. We had Really great experience. We played plenty of games, man. Like, we really played a lot of games. We had some scrimmages in there. Felt like I was in school. We wake up every morning for mobility. And after that, we probably go do some ball handling. If not, we have game right after. He's putting in about two, three games a day. We're telling you, we play him about three to four times a week. It was a really great experience. It was well worth it. And I really hope that we continue the ball. I just want to ask anyone that's out there in Freeport or probably just in the Bahamas still in school trying to play ball, build on your skill. Uh, D1 Development is a really great program. You also should try and get out at it, but 242 Elite is a really great traveling program. Welcome back to Something to Think About with Dale Happy Knows. We're here this evening talking to Chris Omoshango Davis, who is a historian um, and many, 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 many more things along the way. He's having a very enlightening conversation, and it's about him enlightening us on, on our uh, roots. And, you know, roots in the morning, roots, roots, mm -hmm. anyway, <laughs> our roots, and um, whether the um, we are being gaslighted about our roots as to whether we're from the Africa, um, Haiti, Cuba, et cetera. And we've walked down a, a long road so far. And um, um, Chris, whilst we were out, we were going to try to confirm whether, um, whether you had a hard stop or not, because from mm -hmm. some of the inboxes that we've been getting people want you to stay on uh, i don't know what was your, your, your time like um whether we could continue or we just um, come back another time so we can do we could do a little while longer a little while longer. Okay. We, a little while longer. Yeah. we know we want you to come back for a specific pro project 
at a specific right. time. Uh, right. You know, yes, I don't want to kill them, but you. But anyway, <laughs> awesome. So, um, folks, remember to put your questions up because we want to address as much as you can with you. And so, Holly Bino here says, uh, "Chris, that is uh, done. What are what what are done of the steps post-colonial countries can take to start to come back all of this?" cultural amnesia and erasure. What's our plan to liberalize and freedom? And oh, well, that's, that's, yeah, Sister Holly. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good one. Well, we have to realize the reality of the state that we're in. Sadly, you know, nobody could actually point to a specific moment in history where we have crossed this. Um, imagine, and even when you look at things like you, the civil rights movement in the United States, where you find out that, hey, well, that was just really a big farce and integration actually did more harm because um, it destroyed black businesses and all of these different things, further gentrified community. Even in the of they actually compensated. Mm -hmm. And it was a massive payday uh, for them, actually. Right. And, and that was what made them make, make the money and gain the comfort so that they could move into what they call the Industrial Revolution. And when you look at the crux of the Industrial Revolution, you see things like cotton textiles, so where they're getting all this cotton from, you know? And then, of course, so it's just about digging into our history. I know it might sound biased because I'm a historian and I'm trying to get people to, to get into that, but it's the truth, though. History is the most unifying force. So let's look at the United States. Let's look at the the Karens and the Chads of the United States, if you will, the conservative white mindset of the United States. Mm -hmm. All of them are firmly grounded on their history, and it's one big lie. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a lie, all of them believe it. You know, they mm -hmm. believe that their forefathers were great, honorable men who only believed in freedom and justice and that the American way is all about liberty and all of this stuff and how they beat the British. And they don't like to talk about the war 18 and 12, but they can talk right. about mm -hmm. independence all day. They ain't going to talk mm -hmm. about Canada being bigger than the United States um, in terms of the landmass, they can right. say you understand. Um, so that's what it is for us. And we have to stop buying in to these Eurocentric narratives. And when we look at Eurocentric narratives, we have to take that with a grain of salt. And then we have to start looking back. And that's why I went to uh, Pakasu in Ghana, Princess mm -hmm. Town. You know, there's a man in Pakasu, the chief of Pakasu. His name is Yaw. Uh, I can't, I don't want to butcher his first name. His first yeah. name has nine syllables. Apopo mm -hmm. <laughs> Sakianas. <laughs> right? I don't want to butcher him. I just, Chief Yaw Augustine. This man mm -hmm. sits in the same throne that John Canoe sat in. Okay. Right now, when mm -hmm. I shook this man's hand, I could just melt, you know. And I don't mm -hmm. even know if they realize the level of um, awe that I have that this is a man that sits in the throne, right? Mm -hmm. At John Canoe sat in, mm -hmm. and then you start to get the real, true essence of John of John Canoe itself, mm -hmm. you know. And we know it's a warrior thing, to it, You know, we know that it was kind of watered down to to suit and be more palatable to tourists. You know, um, mm -hmm. and so all of these are things we have to dig into. And the Bahamas has so many family historians, you know, but it's just that uh, we look at it through European lenses and we have to right, start right. looking at it through Bahamian lenses, through African lenses, you know, and look at all sides. And there are so many unsung um, Bahamian heroes. And one of the people that came here, as a matter of fact, in 1734, his name was Kwamino. And he is one of the people that links the Bahamas directly to the same region where John Canoe was functioning. Right. Right. And what made me wonder is, how is it that we have the biggest John Canoe celebration in the world? Ours is actually bigger than the one in Princess Town because they only have about five, 6,000 people, right? However, we have the biggest John Canoe commemoration and the they also have it in Jamaica and certain communities. They have it in Belize, it's manifest and it's in the Bahamas. Okay. You have it in Suriname, Guyana. You even have um, essence of it in the old United States, in the, in the southern United States, in the 1800s, and different all over. Why is it that all of these places have a Khan, people from modern day Ghana, national heroes? So you go to Jamaica, you see Queen Nani, Captain Kujo, right. you go to Guyana, you see Kofi. You go to Antigua, you see Kwaku, you go to Virgin Islands, you see Brefu. When I was in Ghana and I was calling out all these names, 
some of the people is raising their eyes saying, Hey, that's my name. Right. You understand? Right. I say, Oh, right. that's my mommy name. That's my auntie name. That's my son. Mm-hmm. I was meeting people named Kwame and I met about 25 people named Kwame. You know, mm-hmm. the same name that the other man that came here from that right. same region mm-hmm. in Ghana. You mm-hmm. understand? Um, <clears throat> and Kwame and his plan, like the other, his Akan revolutionary counterparts, was to kill all the colonizers in the island, starting with Governor Fitzwilliam. Mm-hmm. And see, this was one of the reasons that galvanized them to build a safe space for the governor. You understand? Kwamina came here. He is actually misnomered as Quarino. It was a simple mistranslation, and I saw the documents. And when I saw that man was Kwamina, my wife would tell you, I had tears rolling down my eyes because mm-hmm. I knew the connection had been made. This is our Akan revolutionary. Sat in okay right now when mm-hmm. i shook this man's hand i could just melt you know and i don't mm-hmm. even know if they realized the level of um awe that i have that this is a man that sits in the throne right mm-hmm. at john canoe sat in mm-hmm. and then you start to get the real true essence of john of john canoe itself mm-hmm. you know and we know it's a warrior thing to it you know we know that it was kind of watered down to, to suit and be more palatable to tourists you know, um, mm-hmm. and so all of these are things we have to dig into. And Bahamas has so many family historians, you know, but it's just that uh, we look at it through European lenses and we have to right, start right. looking at it through Bahamian lenses, through African lenses, you know, and look at all sides. And there are so many unsung um, Bahamian heroes. And one of the people that came here, as a matter of fact, in 1734, his name was Kwamino. And he is one of the people that links the Bahamas directly to the same region where John Kino was functioning. Right. Right. And what made me wonder is how is it that we have the biggest John Kino celebration in the world? Ours is actually bigger than the one in Princess Town because they only have about five, six thousand people, right? However, we have the biggest John Kino commemoration in the world. They also have it in Jamaica in certain communities. They have it in Belize. It's manifested as a play, but it's not as loved as it is in the Bahamas. Okay. You have it in Suriname, Guyana. You even have um, essence of it in the old United States, in the, in the southern United States, in the 1800s, and different all over. Why is it that all of these places have a Khan, people from modern-day Ghana, national heroes? So you go to Jamaica, you see Queen Nani, Captain Cujo, right. you go to Guyana, you see Kofi. You go to Antigua, you see Kwaku. You go to Virgin Island, you see Brefu. When I was in Ghana and I was calling out all these names, some of the people was raising their hands saying, hey, that's my name. Right. You understand? Right. I say, oh, right. that's my mommy name. That's my auntie name. That's my son mm-hmm. name. I was meeting people named Kwame, and I met about 25 people named Kwame. You know, mm-hmm. The same name that the other man that came here from that right. same region mm-hmm. in Ghana. You mm-hmm. understand? 
um, <clears throat> and Kwamina's plan, like the other his Akan revolutionary counterparts, was to kill all the colonizers in the island, starting with Governor Fitzwilliam. Mm -hmm. And see, this was one of the reasons that galvanized them to build a safe space for the governor. You understand? Kwamina came here. He is actually misnomered as Quarino. It was a simple mistranslation, and I saw the documents. And when I saw that man was Kwamina, my wife would tell you I had tears rolling down my eyes because mm -hmm. I knew the connection had been made. This is our Akan revolutionary counterpart that coincides with all of the vestiges of Chankanu. So when you look at Suriname, it exists in two of the Akan Maroon communities. Okay. When you look at Jamaica, it manifests in places like Kujo Town and Akumpong and Cormantian. These are towns in Jamaica and they are also towns in Ghana by the same mm -hmm. exact name. You understand? And so we are inextricably linked with these people and John Canoe was never no slave. After mm -hmm. he had committed many of the, or done many of these uh, military feats, for example, defeating the British in 1712 at Fort um, Metal Cross in present day Dix Cove. And they like to say that John Canoe was given to us on Christmas day by the British. Well, one of John Quow's military strategies was to actually wait until Christmas day to invade these European forts. So as mm -hmm. we said, the farmers catch them slipping. Right. <laughs> so when they drunk and they eating and they marry and they doing all that, that's when John Kwau, aka John Canoe, was attacking these fellas. You understand? After mm -hmm. he had severed ties with the Germans, after they sold their possessions to the Dutch without even telling him, that was when his true colors came out and it, and it was revealed that he was just using his alliance with the Prussians mm -hmm. uh, to actually garner these weapons and these cannons. And the people there actually went to Parker who playing devil's advocate, talking about well in the Bahamas. They tell us this man was just a big time slave trader. And boy, right. people, at one point I thought this can roll me out. And then I had to reveal myself and be like, no man, I was only playing devil's advocate because that was my theory all along. Why would we make such a huge hero out of this man? And right. this goes back um, to Holly's question. We've been doing this parade. This is something that all of us love. Even white Bahamians rush now. You understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that being a time but in a they're school, not white. Right, right. I'm right. Gonna say everybody comes from that's that's the right. Yeah. Again, right? White white in the Bahamas, right? Let's mm -hmm. let's clear that up. We can get into that too, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, but essentially those that identify as what I should say in the Bahamas, even love and appreciate John Canoe. And mm -hmm. I believe that being a time in a space now where people could view the past. And they could, you could, in certain, certain modes in history, certain times in history, it's, a, it's clear who the good guy and the bad guy is to simplify yes, yeah. it, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those cases, you know. And when we realize who this man, John Canoe, was, John Kwao, his real name, G Y A N K W A W, this, this man was just absolutely amazing. And the more I learn about him, he was not wealthy because he was trading in slaves. One of the reasons he was so wealthy was because he controlled one of the major freshwater reserves in that entire region. And this region was in the southern extremity and the western extremity of present day Ghana. Right. Right. He also controlled all of the gold in the area. He had troops of over 15,000 people made up not only of a hunter people, which who he, who he was from, also right. the Nzima, the Wasa, the Ga, the Ewe. All of these different groups, about 20 different groups of Africans in there, you know, and that's why um, one of the theses of, of this book that I'm working on now is that Chankin was actually a unifying force. <clears throat> and yeah. to put it in a nutshell, when you look at the early British transatlantic slave trade and the early Dutch transatlantic slave trade, they almost exclusively took them from that um, Gold Coast region. Okay. And so the first four slave ships that came directly from Africa, one of which was owned by Governor Fenny, George Fenny, and the other one was owned by, by Woods Rogers and his family. And that was the one that this man, Kwamina, actually arrived on in 1730. And ironically, that ship was called the Nassau. So mm -hmm. when Woods Rogers came and he said, expel pirates and restore commerce, that commerce was turning the Bahamas into a full-fledged slave slaving state. And he was even looking at my beloved homestead in the Bahamas, Kid Island, looking to make mm -hmm. Kid Island talk about Kid Island is perfect to, to have all of these sugar plantains. This man wanted the workers to death and they wanted to emulate other colonies like um, St. Domingue, which is present day right. Haiti, which was mm -hmm. the richest colony in the West at the time, almost three times richer than the United States in the zenith. You know, yeah, so these are the richest. Yeah. Right, right. In many oh, ways, right. exactly. Yeah. Just the people poor, but you know, that's a whole nother thing. It's like mm -hmm. Africa, you know, the people poor, but 
Africa is not poor, right? Mm-hmm. Right, and again, to <clears throat> um, to just or she said as enzima is enzima n z e m a enzima is actually a twin group of the Ahanta people, and the capital city is known as Takaradi and Sekundi, and Ahanta actually means twin. These Ahanta people are absolutely amazing. As as we do more research and as I reveal more, you all see exactly why. Okay. and why their history has been swept under the rug, especially as it pertains to their connection to us over here uh, in the West. And just to close on this point and to sum up all of what Harley was talking about, um, there's a, another Ahanta king. So John Kuao, John Kanu was actually the chief of a region, but he wasn't right. the big king of all Ahanta. Mm-hmm. One of the big kings of all Ahanta lived a full hundred years after John Kanu, and his name wow was Nana Bonsu the second. He and I got hundred years after? After so John how old did he live to, how, how old he lived to be? Well John Kuao, John Kanu was actually a very he lived a very long time because I learned on my last trip from Brother Alec Kofi that mm-hmm. um he was the king in the mid 1680s sorry mm-hmm. in the mid 1680s he was the king but he was not at his heights yet. Right. He aligned himself with the Prussians and essentially use his Prussian allyship and the rivalry. The same, it's so funny because he used the same thing they claimed that the Europeans did was what Jean Kwa was doing. He was using this European rivalry against them and playing these fellas like fools, all mm-hmm. the while protecting everyone under his king, under his um, kingdom that he had there in the Southwest from the transatlantic slave trade. He had a giant wall from the lagoon to the river. And he had a rule that even if you go to pick berries, you got to carry 50 people with you to make mm-hmm. sure these Europeans, not Africans, don't enslave you. And his right. story goes against the narrative of Africans enslaving other Africans. And mm-hmm. at the same time, they don't use the narrative when they talk about World War II. Western Europeans who are far less diverse than West Africans. And they wouldn't say, well, look at these Europeans fighting against each other. But when it suits their narrative and it suits easing their collective guilty conscience and vindicating them in a historical sense, they love to say Africans and slaves and other Africans, even though these were a diverse group of people, number one and number two, even though you have countless examples of those that fought against the transatlantic slave trade. Then you begin to understand why the story had to be appropriate. You can't have Africans in the Bahamas marching around talking about they praising John Canoe and this the man who was spanking up the British and the Dutch right. early 1700s. You understand? Yeah. They are yeah. the change the narrative. So then it become this thing where we just having fun, masquerade. And all of a sudden, uh, despite all of the evidence we have, somehow they tell us that the white man allowed us to do this. Right, yeah. You understand? So, <laughs> yeah, but, but that's part of the gaslighting there. But, but right. Rosemary Hannah asks the question, how do we uh, get this information in our schools? And, and well, I would just suggest this one, that first we need to get it documented, as um, Chris is doing in, in his mm-hmm. work. And so anybody out there who went uh, willing to fund his work, or assist him with that, that would be great because that will help to get the information um, documented first. And then once you get it documented, you can package it. And then um, I'm sure he has good connections where he, he could use to get uh, I hope so. the, audi- the yeah. audience, right? So, well, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of the present Minister of Education. I feel that she yes, is mm-hmm. just one of the best positive examples of a politician, despite so many bad examples that we have, you know, mm-hmm. she is one I've always uh, admired. Um, and so I'd love to reach out to her and discuss with her. And, I'm, and even with her in that post, I'm confident that a lot of the stuff um, that I'm talking about and that other great historians, of course, Dr. Curry, who's also a mentor of mine, right. you mentioned another person I see as a mentor, Dr. Nicolette Bethel. Right. You know, they don't be over my shoulder while I researching, but it's there is her is actually her research because her and her father Clement, of course, mm-hmm. these were the first people to really start to delve into this thing that we call Chunk Canoe. Right. And they were the first ones to challenge the notion that this was something given to us by the British. And that's what gave me the bravery and gave me the platform to then mm-hmm. um, dig even further. You know, and of course, um many, many others, you know, but I think that it will get into the curriculum. Um, I think that it might get a small fight mm-hmm. from those that have benefited from perpetuating a certain historical narrative, unfortunately. But I also believe that um, the people's will will prevail in that in that sense. And 
people thirsting for their real history, you know? And right. I just find it, even though it's a kind of labor of love for me right now, but I find it still extremely fulfilling. Like I say, tears come, some like I could spend months and don't find anything significant. And when I find something that sometimes, some, some, something that I'm not even looking for, and I able to put certain stories together and piece them together, you know, sometimes I laugh with joy and happy with joy. And sometimes it makes me cry, you know, especially mm -hmm. some of, uh, examples of slave ships that landed here. Um, right. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I touched on the Haiti part from Breakin. Um, I don't know if you know, but I'm a descendant of Stephen Dillett. And, you know, oh, wow. all right. When, yeah. when we go to that, and, you know, a lot of people have this argument as to whether he was a white man, whether he was a black man, whether he was, whatever it is, right? But um, Joseph Eugene Dillett, um, according to Sean McQueen, he would have. Um, been an inside son on the original Stephen Dillett, and he left as a young man, and he went to Guyana, and then the West Indies Regiment, right. and then he was on to Sierra Sierra Leone. That's how you pronounce it. Sierra Leone, right? Like, yeah, Sierra Leone. Yeah. So that's another yeah. connection going oh, yeah. back that way, based on. Oh, yeah. Well, Sean McQueen is, is that another. You mentioned just now, right? Sean McQueen is another. Um, Probably unknown mentor. I've read all of his books and I've drawn a lot from his books, particularly on my outlook on race and mm -hmm. racial, this very own unique racial Bahamian critical theory that we have, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, and Stephen Dillett, personally himself, the first Stephen Dillett, I should say, that came here. Mm -hmm. um, he came, remember, his father was a French officer. His mother was you know, an African, he, uh, um, an African. And essentially, mm -hmm. um, he came here. And Stephen Dillard is very interesting for me because I actually could make a strong comparison to W.B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. where in the beginning, um, though he simply because of who he was, of course, he represented black people, quote unquote mm -hmm. black people. But at the same time, he may not have shared the sentiment that he himself was a black man. But mm -hmm. then through his experiences and as he got older, he kind of, um, as you would say, crossed over or, or had the right sort of mentality, right. at least as, as in, in regards to his outlook on race, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he was central in one of our uprisings in 1832 in the election where he was one of the people that won a seat. And of course, most people know him as the first person of color to win a seat. Mm -hmm. But he was coming from a time and a space, remember, exactly. in, in the French um Racial system is very different than the Baham than the British one, and even right. more so the Bahamian one. You know, mm -hmm. and so even someone like you, even in a place like Cuba, you know, race is very different. Right. And it's again running from that, running from Africa, running from being identified as African. And so you have, like in Haiti, for example, there's over a hundred different gradations of race. Right. Whereas in Bahamas, you are about between six and eight, depending on the time right. and, and the space, right. you know? Right. And like you use the term Sambo, for example, you know, right. that had numerous meanings in different places. But in the Bahamas, it essentially means that you had one white grandparent. Right. You understand? Right. That's what a yeah. Sambo meant in the Bahamas. It was, and it was literally about accounting for the amounts of black, the drops of black blood that you had, which is yeah. very different than the one drop rule in the United States where, yes. you know, I don't know if you know Quincy Jones' daughter, famous actress Rashida yeah. Jones. You yeah. know, and mm -hmm. he literally looks very, very, quote unquote, white. And she is up to remind people that, hey, I black and I identify as black, even though I'm very light skinned with straight hair and all of that stuff. You know, that's Quincy yeah. Jones. Well, I, you know, I thought people um, as light as I am, my mom is lighter than me. Yeah. It's <laughs> dark, right? Um, right? Her sister but, is dark. Um, so they's gonna, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. So, I mean, to me, that doesn't. That doesn't decide who you are. And so that's, that was the next part of the question, which in terms of our complexions, we tend yeah. to, to look at people's complexions and then determine who they are or what they right. are or what they're not. Yeah. My mom will tell you some stories about it in the 50s, 60s, when she would have been going to Grand Bahama Freeport area. And you know when they saw her, she might have passed a certain degree. But then when they saw her children, that was... <laughs> Um, passport revoked, revoked, you oh, know, yeah, yeah. You're not getting in indicates the way we run, and that's a story by itself. Oh, yeah, I mean, that era of time in the dependent era of history that we really need to dig into too in those early oh, yeah. days before mm -hmm. our majority rule and the like. But, yeah. um, I always ask the question of people, um, who say that they are black, 
in the Bahamas and they oh, you, you, you white, you this and stuff. I said, do you know if you're really black or you're not black? Because <laughs> if we look at all of these, uh, um, the mulattoes, the quadroons, the sambos, right. I think it's the streets and whatever, all yeah, those different see, things yep. that people list mm -hmm. and stuff like that. How do you know what you really are? Because like I said, my mom is light, but right. her parents, Personally, her parents are dark. Right. My view of it is that you should do away. We should do away with all of those terms, really and truly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's just something that's almost unexplainable, first and foremost. You could see a person, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they look, the way they speak, you know what I mean? The, the, mm -hmm. They suck they teeth or not. All of these are different things that, you know, but remember, it's important to remember race is a social construct, so there'll never really be a definitive answer. And these terms like mulatto, musty, and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. these are terms that were meant to demean us, even though now these are the terms that we identify ourselves with, but it's a testament to how um, gaslighted that we've actually been, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in my view, from, and particularly from a Pan-African view, um, once a person is of clear and obvious African descent or identifies as such, then they, quote, unquote, black. Now, mm -hmm. me personally, I use it for common vernacular. But I, when I say black, I mean African. That's what I, I mean. Know what you mean. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it means. But, mm -hmm. you know, we have, even though race is a social construct, it's a very real social construct. And it's a very, I don't want to say valid social construct, but it's very significant because it affects our destinies. It affects how we view each other, how we treat each other all of these different things. It's even like money. Money is a social construct based mm -hmm. solely on the faith that we put in it. Yeah. But I can say I can give you all my money. <laughs> it's a social construct, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it, it, it goes back to identity. That's the key thing, right? I mean, right. I mean uh, yeah. my thing is that everybody, scientists have said that they've proven that everybody came right. um, from Africa and yeah. first African to black. Yeah. Sorry, I might have called woman that mm -hmm. gave birth to all Homo sapiens in the world today. Mitochondria Eve. Okay. Right. And her DNA is inside every living human being. From Adolf Hitler, <laughs> she mm -hmm. he come from her, I come from her, you come from her, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King come from her, and Malcolm X come from her. You know? Right, right. So Malcolm X and Hitler come from that same, you know. So yeah. So of course. It's not to swash over the history and the realities that exactly. we live in, but it's it shows you the fallacy of of race, and it actually, in my view, exacerbates all of these things that happen. Is because it's not even based on any foundation, scientific or, or otherwise. You know. But but if we if we look at that, I look at that and say, okay, if we now know these things, then from an intellectual point of view, that means that we should now be moving back to the point where we are one. You know, yeah, that, that right. there is no divide or no separation. Mm -hmm. So we had different complexions and this and that. So right, exactly. We need to right. now be moving in a direction where we all getting into that one, right. one oh, yeah. and we just see people. We don't see nothing else. It's yeah. going to take time. Yes, we know that because, I mean, pains and but stuff. There's a there's a, a white Bahamian, and he in pretend white. He actually white, blonde mm -hmm. blue eyes, <laughs> all that stuff. Okay. He did his um, what is it, twenty three and me, with the one the DNA thing, okay. and he came out over twenty percent African, mm -hmm. you know. And so we have to realize actually how superficial our exterior actually is. You know, your complexion and all of that stuff. It really has very little to do. Um, it has significance, of course, but it has at the end of the day very little to do with your actual biological being, your genes and all of that stuff. You know. Yeah, because I mean, I have a friend who was in school with me at, at, at the U in Miami, and he isn't as dark as you, but I mean, he's dark. But when he did it, and they most of say he came from Ireland and up in that area, yeah. the majority right. of what's in his DNA package. Um, right. Well, you know, see, it's, so, see it's, it's very complex, and see, it's in as many different strains of thought on it, too. And again, I say it's very complex. You will have some that will argue that, you know, the African gene is dominant. Mm -hmm. And so many of my counterparts in the Pan-African world, um, they what they did is um, adopt the one-drop rule and okay. spin it around and use it for mobilization and solidarity. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so the go the, the saying I kind of agree with it. So the whole thing is, hey, if you have one drop of African blood in you and you identify as such, you African, you with us, we ain't care what complexion you fall on in that grade, or even what percentage of your DNA say. You know, if you culturally and you um Dr. Curry often uses the term, you have the phenotypical and then you have the ontological. You right. understand, right? Mm-hmm. And so the phenotypical is me. Of course, I'm phenotypically African. Mm-hmm. Right? I got a flat nose. I'm very dark. You know, uh, my eyes are yellow and all of these different things. Phenotypically mm-hmm. African, you know. Um, but we have many of us who are phenotypically African and ontologically European. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You understand? And it doesn't necessarily mean that because you pronounce your E's and R's, that that makes you any less African or even socially conscious about certain issues. It's not about that, but it's just about your essence and what you and your actual values. You know, that's what it's more about uh, than that. And again, for us as people of African descent, we have to look at race for what it is—a social construct. However, still acknowledge the realities that it play for us. It don't mean it don't matter because it definitely does matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter, Sam. Yeah, you know? But, yeah. but for people who are millennials and younger, it's it has, on a day-to-day basis, a less impact um, yeah, in terms yeah. of what they see and then what somebody who would have been closer to the periods back then that you spoke of already. Uh, right. So in, in time, things is going to all blend together as, as a good book. Yeah. Um, Tell us to, that we well, can. and then you, even even you know many even Europeans you know it's of course when you look at historically you know there is of course a heavy leaning towards mm-hmm. European versus African right. and it's still like that in many ways. However, you still have many Europeans who um who who empathize with the cause. You know, and mm-hmm. I'm not talking about those that appropriate the cause, like the fellas you see leading the line. I know what you mean. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? But uh, but you do have you know people of European descent who genuinely, and I also know um, a handful of Bahamians uh, who are uh, quote unquote conky Joe, and they mm-hmm. rejecting that now, and they saying, "Look, man, I black too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> and I yeah. sure you don't have a problem with it, you know. No, and that's no, but as I said, they all, we all come from the same place. So I right, mean, that's exactly. the way I look at it. You know, so as as we sorry. as we wrap up, because I know I, I eat a couple more of your minutes than what that I, I know it ain't a cell phone where you, you run out and you just drop, but still uh how how do we move forward in this new day to get this unified identity so that we know who we are as Bahamians and and Africans in the Bahamas and by its most global verbiage of the meaning of the word African or Black yeah. in Bahamian. Another thing we could do too is we need to talk to our elders, talk to our mm-hmm. griots, you know, the okay. that that ninety year old great grandmother, start mm-hmm. talking to her, you know. Unfortunately. Many times they are also they are they, they are gaslight is more serious than ours as we move into yeah. this information age, and that's understandable. But you could still grasp things. You know, I have a great auntie who still is talking nostalgic about the days of the UBB in Kid Island. Yeah, yeah. they used to bring us so much harm in Turkey and all of that. And I asked her the last time I saw her. You know, they you know they getting very old now. My uncle Jeter just died. May he rest in peace. A few mm-hmm. months ago. And, you know, and but at the same at the same time, I asked her bluntly, I guess it's the Shango and me because he's known for being blunt at times. But I was like, so well, I ain't gonna call the name of the family, but mm-hmm. people know who it was, you know. So where he is now, you know, he's still around, you know, you know, they mm-hmm. still there and there and there, but we had him, you mm-hmm. know. And even so, you know, racism is very real in the Bahamas, and that's that's something that people don't want to acknowledge, you know. It's very real. And you often hear Bahamians, it's almost like we don't want to deal with swallowing certain pills. And so when we get into these racial historical issues, you often have, oh, well, you know, I get white in my family and all of that. And I usually ask them, well, how much of them show up to your family reunion? Mm -hmm. And usually the answer is none, right? Right, So. Mm You know, yeah, you all may have the same blood. But that don't make you all family all the time, you know. Yes. But, you know, and it's not about hating anybody. It's about telling the truth. Because only when we know this truth, then we can know what's wrong with us. You know, if you view us as a human body, as a human, you know, we have this traumatic childhood. 
and we just trying to plow going into adulthood now, trying to plow right. through adulthood, and we have the traumatic childhood that we're not even trying to acknowledge, you right. know. Right. And so that's how you look at it, you know. And so we can always have shortcomings. We can always hold on to what we shouldn't hold on to and let go what we should be holding on to until we um, dive into these things. And as Bahamians start to, um, we will all find um, aspects of our history that we can be proud of, particularly when you see things connected to you or your island or your name, you know? Mm -hmm. As I'm sure you've experienced in studying the Dillard family, the things that I show sure made you cringe, but for the most part, I'm sure it's, it's, a, it's a history that you could be proud of, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I need to put you in contact with, with some of my family members who are actually running all of the, the details because they always get, you right. know, all fired up when they hear different things that people say about different things and they say, well, don't go like that. And I said, but yeah, but y'all know this, but y'all not telling nobody else. Um, yeah, you need to tell so yeah, you yeah. need to tell somebody who could talk about it in right. a conscientious mm -hmm. way. And so maybe you well, might yeah. need somebody who, who could help them with it and you and you and right. they could help you um so, in, your, in your walks right so forward and so and leslie yes he is uh um gonna come back um chris is gonna come back we have a special show that we want to do um, yes on a special sub subject in particular and so once he gets prepared on uh, in position to do that then he's gonna He's going to tell me to come back and he's going to give me the show before he gave it to anybody else but <laughs> <Yeah>. you know <laughs> right. and so forth and so forth um but um, so before we take our leave, Chris, the last question I have before I give you the, the opportunity to say anything you want to say to the public would be is that what identity opportunity stands out the most uh, that we could benefit today? Oh, well, there's many things. Uh, even on my first two trips uh, to Ghana, Mm -hmm. um, with the networking that we did, um, what you start to realize is um, ways that you could connect with each other on every level. So, of course, we spoke mostly about um, genetically and historically right. and connected. culturally, mm -hmm. but there's also several economic um, ways, particularly in Ghana. Ghana is known as the gateway to Africa um, and the home of Pan-Africanism um, as well, you know, and um there's too many benefits that I could name, you know. For example, in Ghana, they have a surplus of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. You know, tomato is a, is a, is a big base <laughs> for what we do here, you know. I'm not a guy who knows everything, and I would just encourage people to visit, mm -hmm. particularly um, even the rural areas like Pakasu, you know, where John Canoe is from. Right. From you go there and you tell them people, hey, I'm from the Bahamas, they know now, and then we made the connection, and they can treat you like a king, just like they treat me, you right. know, and it's just so much things in that area. Um, just to reconnect with it. And when you, it just gives you, it's like, I just been having good luck since then. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's because I have this um, proper view of myself. Right. And, it's, it's, and it's something that you can't experience. And when you go, you know, you need to visit um, the forts. When I visited Fort Gross Friedrichsburg in Princess Town, AKA Parkasu, you know, um, Robin Lightburn um, accompanied me as well, youth manager of the Red Cross, okay. as well as my wife, Tamara Scavello. And we did the humanitarian, or I don't like that word, sorry, the outreach initiative as well. That's why this trip hasn't been so publicized because we didn't want to have all these kids' pictures and all that there. Right, right. So we're mm -hmm. trying to do properly structured um, with the proper permission and all that before we actually show people um, a part of the initiative. So it's not just uh, research. Right. Um, I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch, but um, it's going uh, very, very well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as things manifest, um, I'm sure that the entire nation will be proud <clears throat> of our shared history with the people of Parkasu. Um, people got to get to know this man, your Augustine. He's sitting in the same throne as John Canoe. Like, I don't think I need to say anything more about right. that. Right. You know what right. John Canoe mm -hmm. is, who he was, right? Then mm -hmm. you have Alex Kofi, you know, you have... Um, several gas houses in the area and then you have the surrounding areas that are also linked to john Kuo, um particularly uh Boswa, where he mourned some of his battles you know um and so this is the stuff that i learned going there you are immersed in it when you see somebody who doing something that you all do one of the people who is with us you know they, they say they're feeling a little down and the fellas start talking in tree which is their um indigenous language around right. there and all I hear is fever grass. I say, hold on, what would you just say? <laughs> fever grass? I say, y'all are fever grass. Yeah, I say, yeah. And y'all is call it the same thing. He's like, yeah. It's yeah. like, what? Fever grass. You know, they mm -hmm. got shepherd's needle. It was just amazing to see some of the similarities and just know 
Yeah, that's where we come from. You know, it's another thing that was so funny. The drivers in Ghana, we drive bad. Jamaicans drive horrible. And Ghanaians, just in an entire category, <laughs> all by themselves. <laughs> no disrespect to my yeah. brothers in Ghana. Yeah. Boy, it is drive crazy. Mm -hmm. But it was so funny because every time you almost get in a collision, which is common on almost every journey, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they have this expression. They say, ish, ish. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know we say itch, and itch mm -hmm. is an expression that we use at that crucial moment of impact. And right. we do the same thing with this expression itch, and I was just like making all these connections, and right. it's almost like you home, mm -hmm. you know. And then when you return back, you you see things um differently. There are many people there; they are huge on manufacturing in Ghana. I can speak mm -hmm. more so to Ghana because that's where I've spent time. Right. And you could go there and you could see many opportunities. They literally given people land who come in from this side. Wow. If you fed them, you know what I mean? Yeah, you want, right. yeah that would be, go to Ghana. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They have a very, if, especially if you're an artist or you or you produce something like that, you know, they have a vibrant, vibrant um, manufacturing um, culture over there. Mm -hmm. On the side of the road, people building furniture. On the side of the road, people making shoes, you know. They ain't no one begging. Even if they um, living on the street, they bring in homemade Q-tips yeah. to try to sell you, you know what I mean? And they just very proud. They have a saying in Ghana that the, um, the women own the land, but the men walk like they own the land. And that's because they do this bop, just like us, they walk with this bop, this confident bop. I say, like, man, look at these fellas, man, you know? So... <laughs> it's honestly undescribable. It's something you have to experience um, when you're there. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's certain things, as in any country, that'll be a oh, culture yeah. shock. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the police are pretty wild over there. I'll say that. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, they, they pretty bold with their wildness. I'll just put mm -hmm. a little bit of that. You know, um, they eat with their hands. You know, and my brother Sam Akpo, shout out to Sam Akpo too. You know, we one day we were sitting down eating and they gave us forks to use because they knew we were foreigners and he was trying to eat with the fork and he slammed the fork. And I was like, man, that's too hard to use. Man. He just started eating with his hands, you know. So Ghana is the type mm -hmm. of place where they don't even have the same hang ups as us. Like you will see two male friends, you know, and they'll just have their arm around each other. Mm -hmm. Gradual lay head on the boy, shoulder and fall asleep. And then they don't even have the same hang ups. Right, that's right. Nobody, so nobody you like money, you know, and all these things. You know, so it's, it's very interesting, you know what right, I mean? And right, you will see right. two fellas sharing a bowl of soup with their bare hands. Mm -hmm. you know? And I respect it, even though I wasn't yeah. partaking as much, yeah, but I respect yeah, yeah. it because I know that it was in defiance of this colonial mindset, you know? Right, right. And they almost look at you sideways if you're asking for a fork, so you better eat with your hands. And boy, if you think you're no spicy food, you know, no spicy food till you go to Ghana, and there's yeah. watch you. <laughs> I'll have to put up a flag on my forehead right. or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> my throat yeah. and everything I can deal with. Yeah, and, and, so, and, and also even to touch on the colorism issue that you spoke of, you know, skin mm -hmm. bleaching is very common in Ghana, sadly. However, without the skin bleaching, you also see many, many, many different shades. You see yeah. someone who blue, black, purple, then you see someone who your complexion. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's people. Always think of this phenotypical African as being very dark, high cheekbones, wide nose, slanted eyes. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's not it. You know, um, all over, and you see all the different diversity. Just in Western Ghana, in the Princess Town area, they have like six different dialects and languages. You know, wow. so it's and just to see Africans speaking like that in itself was fulfilling to me. You know, I don't mean to ramble on, but <laughs> I yeah, can. No, but that's good, you know. But so, okay. is there anything you want to say to the public? Um, before we go, any, just any, any where to find me, and uh, if you are interested in helping out with any of our initiatives, whether it's the research initiative or whether it's the um, outreach initiatives, where we focus on five schools in the area of Parkasu. Um, shout out to, of course, to Youth Empowerment through Soccer International, the SI. Mm -hmm. Shout out mm -hmm. to the quarterly um, group of companies, more specifically QBC, right there in the Mall of Marathon. Right. Um, shout out to them as well. You know, and there are several others. Uh, I don't want to go down that road right now. Yeah. Too many others, Dr. Connell Collins, Attorney Andrew Rule, all of these have been people who have, um, um, and of course, or oh, let me stop where you get in trouble. Yeah. The John yeah, yeah. Commandos and Angelique McKay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, all of these people, yeah, yeah, you know. So I am eternally grateful to them. And um, we are now uh, moving full steam ahead. 
Um, you could find me at Sankofa Flamingo on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, that's the best way to reach me. Just send us a message on there. We're actually working on our website um, and all of these things. And the organization is about to grow so that we could help uh, help us fulfill our initiatives much better. And the ultimate goal actually is to make Nassau a sister um, town to Princess Town Princess and in tandem making both World UNESCO Heritage Sites. Okay, and then in awesome. tandem with that, building a heritage tourism product between mm -hmm. the Bahamas, John Canoe, elevating John Canoe as right. a hero, not just for us, but the diaspora. This man right. is beaten up on the British and the Dutch, didn't get enslaved. His fate, actually, he he was taken to Kumasi, where he founded another town called Quadaso, which meant Calabash. And on his gold coins, he used to have a Calabash on it. And a part of his mythos was he was so rich. When you come there, ask him for money, just take this big scoop and Calabash and scoop you a bunch of gold and tell you go with that gold. Almost like a Ghanaian Mount Musa, you know, almost like a, a, a real life T'Challa, if you will, mm -hmm. Panto, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a history we could be proud of. And you could reach reach me at Sankofa Flamingo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where you could um, you could type it in online. It's it's on Google as well, and you will go right to it. Um, we have we'll a lot have of it on the screen for people. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff coming out as well. Um, and so you could follow us on there. Let us know which initiative um you're looking to support. And we're also um carrying over contingencies. The next trip um will probably be in the next three months or so, but we're still um planning uh for that. Right. Um and it's gonna be on a not a huge scale, but a, a pretty uh, bigger scale, you know, and um, there's a lot of initiatives there, but I don't want to share all online. It's like I said, we're not that type of uh, NGO, you know, right, where we right. go in and we take pictures and smile and photo ops and all that. Right. Um, so people will be able to see what we're doing, but if you want to get involved, you could uh, message us right there um, and we will um, definitely figure out how to get people involved in yes. the way that they want to, right? Yes. One of Shango. Yes, thank you. I, I, I yeah, I've had, had a ball here. Uh, yeah, I'm listening to all of this. So you you give me uh, plenty studying to do. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah. you know, I I'm one I can go back and listen to the tape <laughs> and pick out words, and I go research some of them words that you talk about, some of them people you talk about. Oh yeah, that I might yeah. not have had exposure to before. Yes, and like, and, and I hope. The persons out there who have been listening to the show and who will listen to it in time because um, right. we leave the show up on Facebook and YouTube. You know, take them down so they can be an educational tool for teachers and the like who want to go um, yeah. and tap into them and play whatever portions of it for, like you mentioned, to, to yes. their students and whoever and so forth. Because that's our goal is to just try to change the narrative here in the 242. We don't... Um, we just feel that's the only way life is going to change. If we change the way we think and the way we, yeah. then everything follows from there. So yes. thank you kindly. Thank you all who've been out there on Facebook and show, um, YouTube listening to us and listening to Chris in particular because he had more to say than me. I only had a couple of words. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry, um, my. I, no, man, that's good, man. I can be long-winded, you know, sometimes. Yeah, well, you know, you, you hit the points I, that I wanted you to get into, and so that's the key right there, right? Um, we need to continue these type of narratives, people. Um, let's just not have these one-offs. We need to make it more of a, a continuous thing. And the more we talk about these things, the more people start to understand why people are saying what they're saying versus just make it a one-off and then somebody complain. And then, you know, you just disappear and, and go, go forward. And I don't mean Chris just be a part of the thing. We can have these discussions on our own, right, right. Uh, and so yes. forth. And so far. So thank you, Gan, you all. Chris, thank you a lot. Thank and, um, you me. Looking I forward think, to coming back. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we, we, we're going to arrange that. And um, for that special, 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 special subject that we already talked about that we were going to do. And so what we like to encourage our business, our business, our listeners to do is to pause. Think about it with intentional thought and consider where we go from here. Don't forget to share, 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 share this information and ask your friends to like it. Like, even if you don't want to watch any more shows, still like the show because somebody else is going to get connected to it, who's going to get connected to it, and then it might hit somebody who really going to benefit from it. We hope you have been, this has been a value to you and so forth. 
Um, it surely has been a value to me and from Chris's willingness to stay on beyond an hour seemed to be a, a value to him. Yes, so thank, thank you, you, Chris. We thank our sponsors and all of those friends out there. And if you want to get involved with something to think about, we, we welcome anybody, the students and the like who want to get exposure to broadcasting and uh, different aspects of producing the show. Um, you know, we yeah, we, we want to help people learn and ex be exposed to more things than just doctor, lawyer, accountant, traditional um, academic programs of sorts. So thank you kindly. Stay safe. Okay. Vaccinate and isolate if you don't vaccinate. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all, Madam yes, Producer. Likewise to you. And you can take us home so I can eat some of that.